Well, it's great to be joined by John Embry, who is a senior strategic advisor at Sprott, Inc. How are you, John? Excellent, actually. I'm very bullish on the picture in gold. We can discuss sort of the short-term intricacies as to what's going on right now. Well, yesterday we had a new high for this move, over $1,300 U.S. an ounce, and then a reversal, and that probably gave a few chartist nightmares. But I'd like to start with your macro look at the world that is a reason for one to have a little bit of gold and gold shares in one's side pocket. The world is in sort of the early stages of a tough recession or worse. And very simply, it relates to the fact that there's infinitely too much debt in the world. And if you believe in Austrian economics to the extent I do, when you reach this stage of too much debt, you can't add debt productively. So the economy just wallows. And what's happening is they shove more debt into the system. They can't support it without interest rates dropping to almost zero. And that sort of sparked this whole move to negative interest rates in Europe and sort of very low interest rates in many other parts of the world. And uh, it's just going to continue in this direction until we either have hyperinflation or a collapse. So uh, I think anybody who thinks this is sustainable is going to be proven wrong. We've had some major European banks hitting new lows, Deutsche Bank, Credit Suisse, and these are not little banks. And that's a bit of a signal that the banking system is sort of at the end of its tether. Well, the banking system in Europe is a potential tragedy. Aside from the enormous leverage and derivatives, they also own enormous quantities of sovereign bonds in countries that are essentially, for all intents and purposes, bankrupt. Greece, Portugal, Italy, etc., etc. There's no way out of this without sort of recapitalizing them, and that's, that's coming in the future. You and I have been on this gold story for a few years, I guess almost 50 years, and we went through the 1970s. And we had a pretty good run in the 1970s. Bullion went from $40 an ounce up to a high of about $850 U.S. an ounce. And I guess I'd ask you how you would compare the health of the global economy and the U.S. government today to where it was in the 1970s. Well, there's absolutely no comparison. I mean, you've added so much debt in the interim. Like, you could measure the debt. People talk about debt in the billions in those days. Now we talk about them in the multi-trillions. So consequently, there's no room for sort of what Paul Volcker did in 1980 when he sort of quashed the inflationary sentiment and sort of set up a a long-term financial asset inflation, which has brought us to today. So I would dare say that gold at the bottom of this cycle, which was in 2000, uh, at 270, 260, was infinitely cheaper than it was when it was $35 at the beginning of the 70s. So I would expect to see a move before it's finally over that will dwarf the move from $35 to 850 Now, we have various wild card or potential wild card situations, one of them obviously being Brexit. Who knows about the Middle East? And we've got the American election. And I just came back from China and You and I were just chatting about it, and I figured out that the Shanghai Gold Exchange is not really an exchange. It's a collector of gold from around the world, and that China will announce its official gold holdings when it's good and ready, and I would guess that those will be pretty significant numbers. And the Chinese government is allowing people in China to buy gold bullion, through the banks, and that's a very interesting phenomena. We know that there's an awful lot of paper that ostensibly represents gold, and then there is only so much physical gold. When do we hit the wall on this one? I think we're getting very close, John, quite frankly. Some of the numbers I look at, with the number of paper claims on each available ounce in the West, they're like staggering. I've seen numbers as high as 350 to 1. But even if you used 100 to 1, it doesn't make any difference. The number is absurd. So one thing I would strongly suggest to your listeners is that if they own a paper gold instrument, they had best be sure that it is backed fully with the gold that is allegedly backed with. And I would say 98% of them aren't. So this is going to come to a head, and at the very time people need their gold, if they have the wrong gold vehicle, 
they're going to get settled in paper, and the last thing you want at that moment is paper, and that's what you're going to get. So you got to have the real thing, not to tout our own firm, but the spot physical gold trust is real. It's backed by every single ounce that it purports to be. There are several other vehicles around the world in that fashion, but not many. And the other alternative is to have gold bullion in your own possession, but you must have it out of the banking system. Now, I think of the Royal Canadian Mint's exchange-traded receipt and the Sprott Physical Gold Trust, which is listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange as being suitable vehicles. And in the case of the Sprott Physical Gold Trust, all of the gold is held in storage by the Royal Canadian Mint. Yeah, and it is audited regularly, and I can assure the listeners that it's all there. I have actually been bunking in on that audit because one of the people I advise has gold sitting right beside the Sprott Gold in the Mint, and I've been with Ernst & Young on that audit. Well, I'm glad to hear third-person confirmation of what I just said. And then, of course, there are gold shares, and we both had a pretty good experience in the 1970s in gold shares. They're really a call, a future call on gold in the ground. Could you give us some advice on that? When gold shares bottomed on January the 19th, five months ago this coming Sunday, they were the cheapest I have ever seen them in relation to the gold price, which was also depressed at the time. And since then, in the space of five months, they've rallied 130% unindexed, which is remarkable in itself. And yet they remain very cheap, and the fact is their leverage to gold is remarkable. And if the gold price does what I expect it's going to do, which is move up dramatically from the current levels, I think that the gold shares will be one of the great profit-making opportunities in my lifetime from this point right now. We're in this environment of competitive evaluations around the world. And I guess the next major shoe to drop in that department is that the Chinese renminbi will be devalued to make them competitive yet again in trade. And in a devaluation era, you have to have something that will hold its value. And gold has historically done that. What sort of percentage should somebody consider having? That's depending upon their investment objectives. But we're not talking about people putting all of their money in gold vehicles. This is really a bit of insurance against all these variables. Absolutely. I would suggest that at this moment, an absolute minimum is 10%. And it could be sort of partially in bullion and partially in shares. And if you're more aggressive, if you really agree with what I'm saying, I mean, you could be higher than that with probably more emphasis on shares in the short term, because I think they've got the real leverage. But the long-term holding, the one you probably won't sell, is the bullion. The shares are a trading vehicle with enormous upside. Okay, let's get to silver, John. How are you feeling about silver? Silver, to me, is just waiting for this explosion in the sector. And at that point, as history is any guide, and I believe in this case it's going to be a great guide, the gold-silver ratio collapses. And right now it's about 74 to 1. In in true bull markets, that can fall as low as 15 to 20 to 1. So as much as I love gold, I think the upside in silver is multiples of what it is in gold. So, I mean, say gold went to 2500 bucks, I could see silver easily going to 100 bucks or from these levels. So I, I think, basically, they call it poor man's gold, and I would strongly recommend that individuals get into silver stocks and silver coins and any sort of silver vehicle, because I think the amount of money that's going to be made here is going to be mind-boggling. Now, among the broad strategies, which are the funds that investors should take a look at with the help of their advisors in silver, gold, shares, and then, of course, we have mentioned the the physical. Well, our our two physical trusts, the gold trust and the silver trust, I would strongly, that's the bullion, I strongly recommend people take advantage of that. Our precious metals fund is very well managed by our young team, and I, I don't think you can go wrong buying it at current prices. We have seen tremendous manipulation of the gold market because it's sort of the anti-dollar vehicle and the powers that be are trying to keep the 
currency order together as long as they can. This is Friday morning, and yesterday, Thursday, we saw tremendous volatility in gold. And I guess the advice for people is don't watch this stuff day to day, and it will do its job through this very difficult and challenging period that we're going into. I totally agree. I mean, I think the easiest way to do it is dollar average because this thing is volatile because there's so much interference in the market. I mean, yesterday, there's not a market on earth that would have done what gold did yesterday. It broken out cleanly through 1300 hit 1315 And then out of the blue, a massive wave of paper selling hit it and drove it down 35 bucks in the space of no time. No market on earth acts like that unless it's heavily manipulated. And not surprisingly, when the open interest number came out today on the COMEX, open interest had grown 20,000 contracts or 2 million ounces of notional gold. When you throw that much gold in a market in a very short period of time, not surprisingly, it goes down. That's the modus operandi. It will be overcome in time, and when it is, the gold price is going to the moon. Well, it's interesting that George Soros has come out of retirement, in effect, at the age of 85 and taken a decent position in the gold market. You've got people like his former partner, Stanley Druckenmiller, and then at Sprott, Eric Sprott, who has a really significant gold position. And these guys are experienced. They're not lightweights. And to me, it's a signal that the game is on. Well, there's no question. And another guy you didn't mention is a, who was probably the most successful hedge fund operator in the States, Ray Dalio. I mean, he's been very outspoken on the attraction of gold. So I, I think a lot of people with long-term positive track records are speaking out on the subject now. And they know what they're talking about. The vast majority of people are getting misinformation on the subject. They don't have any exposure, and they are going to be badly hurt in the fullness of time if they don't have exposure. So any of your listeners that are listening to this, don't try to time it. Basically, start buying some and just average in going forward. Yeah, and I guess I'll reiterate that people who are listening should talk to their advisors and just go over their objectives and that they take a position that will give them some insurance but allow them to sleep at night. John, as always, it's a great pleasure. This has been a, an eclectic chat. We'll talk again soon. I think it's a very important chat, John, and I would emphasize that to your listeners. Thank you. Okay, folks, coming up after the news, a two-part interview with our affiliate BNN and David Prince, who is the founder of Harbin.